What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the Jay Campbell Podcast Now, and I'm very excited today to be joined in studio by a good friend of mine now, Dr. Jason Saunders. Jason, what's up, brother? How are you? I'm good, Jay, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on. So I met Jason actually at the Piron Zoy Conference uh, about a month ago now. Man, time flies. And um, he I is think, the I owner. I think that was the last conference that was allowed to. Uh, I know, bro, right? And like, it was an epic conference, by the way. But anyway, so you just real quick on his bio. Um, he's an awesome dude, but uh, he's the Core Therapies Family Wellness Center owner and clinical director, also New Jersey Hyperbaric Oxygen Center, and also the owner of H5 which is uh, Hyperbaric Oxygen Th- Therapy USA Corporation. They sell a ton of these uh, hyperbaric chambers across the world, and he is literally like one of the world's leading experts. That's why I have him on here today. Honestly, his bio is incredible, but because we're in now the post-COVID world, um, you know, I want to talk a lot about how hyperbaric oxygen therapy can help uh, actually people that have uh, contracted COVID. But before we do, let's just you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and like how you got on the Jay Campbell podcast today. Sure, man. Uh, so, you know, we've been, we've been in practice for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. We've been doing hyperbaric for about 12 of those years. Um, it's been a, it was actually a personal journey. So I had a, a pretty bad neuropathy myself at one point back then. And, uh, you know, all the typical things that I would normally try to do to help that and, uh, you know, had no response after about a year and a half. And, uh, you know, hyperbaric was actually the thing that gave me my, my right leg and my right foot back. So, you know, it's, it's been a pretty meaningful piece in my life. And then, you know, we started treating some family uh, who had some pretty serious health issues using the same technology uh, and had also very amazing results for there. And uh, from there, we said, you know what, we have to start bringing this into the clinic, actually, you know, utilizing it at the time, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of research on it at this point in time, yeah. but at, yeah. back then, you know, it was pretty limited. So we were just sort of you know, experimenting with each case as it, as it showed up. How did you actually find out about it? Like what led you to it? So total accident. I was just at a, I was at a conference um, and you know, they were there, they had, you know, a a vendor was there and they had chambers. It looked like, it looked like a spaceship to me. I was like, what is this? Right. Right. You know, so I had no idea it would help my foot, but I said, Hey, that looks cool. Can I go in? The guy's like, yeah, sure. Go in. So I go in, I spend like a half hour. I came out and after about 20 minutes, I started getting like tingling in my foot. Like I hadn't felt my foot in about a year and a half. Wow. All of a sudden I'm getting, you know, perfusion and tingling. I was yeah. like, wait, that's crazy. So I went back to talk to him. He started giving me some info. And then I just started like, you know, I, my thing is if, if I'm interested in something, man, I just nerd out on yeah, it. So exactly. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, me know, too. I dig through all the research, trying to figure it out. While I was treating myself, you know, I was developing a, an understanding of, you know, the, the machines, how they work, why they work, what they do to us. And, uh, you know, from there, it's just been a, a process of, you know, helping our community, helping you know, treat our patients. And then it was a question, well, why aren't more people doing this? And so we started really trying to expand that out and help, you know, help patients get chambers if if they want them in their home or help doctors build clinics so that we could be treating, you know, hundreds and thousands of people, you know, it's still, it's still a tool that is misunderstood and there's still a lot of misconceptions around it. So we're really trying to knock that down and really build a broader understanding of like where it fits in the full story of healthcare for, for all of us. Beautiful. Okay. So most of my audience is familiar, but for the people that aren't, why don't you just get a broad overview of what hyperbaric oxygen therapy is and does, and then we'll get into the meats and nuts and potatoes. Sure. So hyperbaric is literally hyper increased baric pressure. So you're literally creating a pressurized environment around the patient. You don't feel that as pressure on you. You know, the, the cabin of an airplane when we right. fly is a pressurized cab. It's basically right. a hyperbaric chamber. Um, so you don't feel that on your body, but you might feel that in your ears. So right. your, your ears pop, you have to equalize that. So hyperbaric is literally just about pressurizing the air around you. And as a result of that pressure, it creates a gradient. So right now, like I'm at sea level, you are too. 
Yeah. Um, so at sea level, there's an atmosphere. That atmosphere creates a pressure. And that pressure is what allows us when we breathe for oxygen to actually go from our lungs into our circulatory system. Right. If you could increase that pressure, you can create a larger gradient. You can drive more oxygen right. into tissues. So that's really all it is. It's, it's a process of uh, changing the pressure around you. And now what we also do is not only change pressure, but we, we can change oxygen levels. So you could do just air pressure. That also helps. Or you could add different levels or amounts of oxygen to that same system, further creating a, a larger gradient, further driving oxygen into the tissue. Typically in our body, oxygen needs to be carried by red blood cells. Right. So as we breathe in, red blood cells that are coming from our tissues that have less oxygen, you know, collect more, and then they go back out to our cells, you know, dump that oxygen and circle back. And so we're limited right now with how much oxygen we can carry based on the, the strength, the efficiency, the ability of those red blood cells to carry that oxygen. There's a range of issues we could talk about, you know, COVID being one of them. Yeah, I was just going to say, and how coincidental right. is it that they're now discovering that COVID itself attacks the heme in Correct. red blood cells, which is obviously limiting the oxygen, creating hypoxia or hypoxia um, reactions in people. And that's why when they come in, they're blue in the face. And as you exactly. know, they were originally wanting to intubate them. And that's absolutely the worst thing you can do for someone that is suffering from a lack of super rich oxygen in the blood. So yeah, so talk about uh, how HBOT can um, help remedy that. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's the whole thing. And, and it's not just COVID, there are other, of course. You know, a lot of other conditions between you know, lung, heart, and circulatory system, and even just brain and other you know, damaged blood vessels or, or nerves. But the idea here is that if, if, we're, if we're only relying on our red blood cells to carry oxygen under normal physiology, that's typically fine, 100% or 98% saturation. Right. You know, we're delivering oxygen to the tissue that needs it, but we don't have a big buffer of like, you know, a, a reservoir of extra oxygen should we need it. Literally, we need to recycle that oxygen every minute of every day just to maintain normal saturation levels. And if we get challenged like uh, a trauma or we get cha challenged like, you know, damage from a virus like with right. COVID, all of a sudden we don't have a reservoir of oxygen. Now, typically let's say with, you know, with other respiratory illnesses, if the patients are having trouble breathing, there's legit mechanical errors in the right. breathing process or restrictions in breathing or fatigue and I just can't keep it up. Right. That's where ventilators make a ton of sense. But, you know, and I'm not on the front line treating these people, but just from all the reports that I'm reading and other doctors that I'm talking sure. to, you know, it, it appears as though for the most part, maybe up until like very end stages, there's really not a lot of respiratory distress. These people right. are breathing. Exactly. They're just not oxygenating. Right. And so, you know, mechanic, so a, a ventilator puts pressure on our lungs. Exactly. A hyperbaric chamber puts pressure on the air. Right. It's a very different mechanism, but they're both trying to oxygenate the patient. But at the end of the day, if, if my lungs are working, right. but I'm not getting oxygen, I need a different way to do that. And so exactly. as we pressurize the environment, what you're doing is you're bypassing the red blood cell carrying capacity altogether. Now, you could still fill up and manage and make the most efficient out of those red blood cells that we have, but we could also dissolve a tremendous amount more oxygen than the red blood cells could ever carry. Right. And we could deliver oxygen, free floating oxygen, not right. bound red blood cell oxygen, but increase free floating oxygen 20%, 50%, 250%, you know, depending on the system, the equipment, the amount of oxygen you're using, the amount of pressure you're using you could deliver enormous amounts of oxygen to these tissues that are starving because of whatever breakdown, you know, it's still new. Like every day, you know, every day we're learning more about this right. virus. So right. you know, every hour that the information seems to change, but to some degree, these patients have an issue in this heme component of right. oxygen delivery. Right. But, you know, we could use hyperbaric to, to bypass that for now to get patients stable and oxygenated while their body's fighting the virus so that they have time. It's, 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 it's just buying time to process the virus. So once they recover, you know, we can move on. Well, just, just, you know, to, to your point, um, you know, one of the smartest people that I know who's one of my business partner, uh, Nick Andrews, very high level biochemical engineer. The guy knows he's been on this since the beginning, but I mean, honestly, dude, like he literally, he, 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 he wants to view this 
after it's done before we even publish it and go, send it out to the company because he really wants to get your opinion. He's probably, I'm probably going to connect you guys, but uh, he thinks that hyperbaric is actually the best intervention right now. It's just as it, you just said, in the exact same capacity because we know the virus does attack the lungs and one of the residual byproducts or after effects post-infection is scarred lung tissue. Right. So the last thing you want is to jam, you know, a pipe. Right, right, right. So he's, he's mm -hmm. saying that, you know, right now that, I, you know, and obviously they don't have the capabilities in all the front lines in the hospitals right now to mass uh, treat people with hyperbaric. But he said, I'm telling you, dude, you know, cause I guess there's a Russian study that he says that's out there too, which I think I sent you guys, yeah. um, you know, where that, that's what they're using in Russia for patients and they've had really good success rate. But I mean, obviously we're way ahead of the curve. You've been talking about this right now. And as you said too, you know, the smartest guys I know say it's a bioweapon. It was highly engineered in a lab to kill people. It has all these different markers, an mRNA coded virus and whatnot. So you're right, we're going to continue to discover. But uh, it does seem like it's the best intervention when you, all, all things considered. Yeah, I mean, the idea is, as we don't need a, we don't need breathing assistance as much as we need right. oxygen assistance. Exactly. There's other ways to do that too. Ozone could be a, a piece right. of that puzzle. Yep. Um, just oxygen, straight oxygen. Right be a part of that puzzle. You know, I think different tools for different phases, depending exactly. on where the person, the patient is at the time. But yeah. you know, another interesting point is that uh, a lot of hospitals have chambers right. and they have multi-place chambers. They could treat six people, 10 people at a time. And I think across the whole country in this moment, they're all closed <laughs> because they, they are because they treat, you know, typically like the insurance indications for hyperbaric are things like gangrene right. and, Right. radiation burden not covid right so because it's not a covered indication it's not an insurance based covered indication and because they were worried that if they were treating wound care with covid patients they're going to obviously you know then they would spread covid around so but now that they're shut let's say we're not using them maybe we could repurpose them hello so and, so you know what well, okay keep going you know. keep going Sorry. yeah but i was just saying like repurpose them for the period and just say hey let's just why don't we take some of these now I, you know, these acute patients and actually process them through the hyperbaric chamber and see what we get at the other end. But there is actually uh, like two days or yesterday, actually, I was online and it looks like uh, they are, um, God, I can't think of the organization. Maybe we could post it later, but okay. they actually are opening a very small um, pilot study of 40 patients in New York using hyperbaric. Oh yeah, that's the one that Scott was talking about. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. you know, they're basically you know, at least it's a, it's a thought out there, you know? But. Yeah. Thank God. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm glad you brought that up because I've had a lot of docs that I've been talking to in the last couple of days now, as you and I said, off air groundhog days <laughs> um, that said the same thing that, you know, along the lines of what you were saying is like, what probably will also come from this is the disintegration of the system. Right. I mean, think about, think about all of the first responders who have literally been exposed to this thing without any kind of like hazmat gear or equipment or, I mean, dude, you talk about putting your life on the line, which they do every single day. Well, this is like that on steroids times 10. Yeah. And so, you know, again, just like thinking ahead, a lot of people are saying that, and you, you probably saw that doctor who's, um, his video went crazy viral. It was like 10 million views. He's in New York City. I think he's at yeah. uh, Cornell or one of those hospitals on the front lines. And he was like, this has to end. You know, the fact that no one is openly even, you know, pro you know uh, putting it out there that this may be a bioweapon and that we are all as first responders in the community being exposed to this. Because again, as you know, there were no masks. There were very, very few gloves. I mean, the whole thing has just been an abomination from yeah. the beginning, from an organizational standpoint. So anyway, a lot of people are saying that hopefully this will also change, you know, the post COVID world as far as like how sick care, you know, that's what I call it. The sick care system can remodel itself. Cause obviously dude, the whole thing is broken as you know, you know, you know more, maybe not more important, but as important and, and maybe more important, I don't know, but you know, there's sort of the, uh, there's the sick care model and then there's the, the well care model, right? The optimization side, you know, and so there's two pieces of this. One, I, I agree that the sick care model has been broken forever. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, our place in that I've always felt is to try to lead the way as an right. example to show people that you could actually have a clinic and treat people and, and do all the right things right. and still make a, a good living and have exactly. a great practice and, yep. and, and be influential in your community and all those kinds of things. 
But I also think that this is going to be a huge wake up call for people because, for sure. you know, I, I've met so many people now who are like, you know, they're so scared of this right. situation and, and they're scared because they know that there's a whole long list of things that they probably could have been doing for the last 10 years to take better care of themselves or things that they needed to stop doing, you know, to take care of themselves. No, you're, you're, now you're all totally of a sudden they're like, like right. They're like, wait, shit, I, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not prepared for this at all. And so my, my hope is that, you know, people look at that and they say, Hey, listen, going forward, this isn't the last time something like this is oh, going to no. happen. I mean, I no. wish it was, but it's just not. No. And no. so whether it's another virus or a bacteria or some other issue with our immune system, if we don't start learning how to take better care of ourselves so that we could, you know, confront these issues, but feel like we're resilient and we can, you know, handle it. We can't shut the world down like right. this on any frequency. Well, Jason, you're being really nice. And I'm glad you changed the topic to that because at, in an hour from now at 1230, I'm talking to an expert on the aspect of this being a bioweapon. He's been researching it on the, deep, on the dark web and you know, China's now openly admitting it. In fact, today on Zero Hedge, there's an article that basically says now that the Korean doctors that have been doing the deepest research on this are now admitting that this thing absolutely can reactivate. So a person can recover and it's, and, and yes, and there's still antibodies left in the system and they can just spontaneously. So, so the bottom line is you're right. And, but you know, you're being nice. You know, I'm Jay Campbell. It's a Jay <laughs> Campbell podcast. I mean, if you are inflamed and you are living a fat MF or lifestyle, you probably are in fear. You probably are a little bit worried because this thing will definitely, you know, attack people with comorbidities yep. who are living inflamed lifestyle. So you're right, dude. You're absolutely right. If anything, this is going to make people look at their health a lot differently. Yeah. You know, I think everybody in conversation, like when I lecture, you know, it's like, what's the most important thing we have? Like most people agree it's our health. And yet, you know, oh, don't take your health for granted. You know, like we say those things, it's like yeah. lip service, but there aren't a lot of people who are necessarily like really dialing that right, into their dude. lives. So it's your only it's, real source of wealth is your health. That's it. That's it. So you know, how many guys do you know, dude, they build their businesses. We're about the same age, but they get they get, they, they put everything into their businesses. You know, they get paid, they got a couple million in the bank and all of a sudden they're almost 50 or right at it or a little over it. And they're literally one foot in the grave physically. Yeah. And it's like, you can't even enjoy it. It's so many of the people who I know, like, my, my, you know, a lot of my, it's the majority, know. bro. Yeah. It's the majority of everyone. And, and we get it right. Cause they put all of their energy into building the business and not into taking care of their physical vessel. Right. It's so important, man. It, it, it absolutely is. And you're right, 100%. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about HBOT. Now, obviously, um, I used it too, and I've used it before, of course. And, you know, I talked about um, how it's a great, you know, inflammation suppressor, right? I mean, you know, you know, Ben Greenfield, good friend of mine, you know, we always talk about red light therapy and all the things it does. But I mean, truthfully, like HBOT, you know, for people that actually have access to them, does even a lot more. So talk a little bit about, you know, what an average biohacker, someone into, you know, elite physical optimization and performance, why they would want to use HBOT on a regular consistent basis. Yeah, sure. So, you know, and I'm a huge fan of all of those tools also, and of we course. use them all in our clinic, of you course. know, um, you know, we look at this from, you know, I think most of your, your audience will know like what, you know, mitochondrial standpoint, right? There so, you, you know, basically, you know, chronic, we don't, we don't die as much from, you know, trauma and infection and all these kinds of things as much these days. It's really these chronic inflammatory issues that exactly. are cumulative over our lifespan. So, and they come from a million places, our environment, our choices, you know, everything that goes on. And so, but underneath a lot of that cellularly, the mitochondria's job, which is to basically make energy for that cell, it has a hard time processing over, over a lifespan of toxicity. Mitochondrial right. membranes are very uh, sensitive to inflammation, sensitive to toxicity. So, but the thing is, is that, you know, if the mitochondria is in a liver cell, then the liver starts to show issues. If the mitochondria in the intestines are having issues, you'll start to have, you know, absorption issues maybe, right. or leaky gut. If, you know, right. if it's in your brain, you're going to have brain fog and, you know, mental fatigue. So, the idea here is how many different ways can we uh, improve the system to make appropriate amounts of energy and to clear out all this inflammation. Right. And red light's amazing. It vasodilates, nitric oxide. I mean, it does a tremendous amount. 
And very specifically, it works on cytochrome C in our mitochondria. So it has like a very direct mitochondrial link. The last um, electron acceptor in the process of making ATP or, or energy in our cell, the last thing that grabs that electron to finish the cycle is oxygen. And like I was saying before, you know, oxygen, we're limited under normal physiologic standpoint, like just sitting here, you and I breathing, we're just limited to how much we have access to. Right. So when you create, uh, I look at it like a vitamin, right? So there are times where if you don't get enough vitamin C, there's consequences to that. It's called scurvy, right? So we don't want that. So we, <laughs> we try to get at least as much vitamin C as we need. Right. Um, but beyond that, most of us would say, listen, I don't want like the bare minimum. I want like the optimum range. Yeah, exactly. You know, I want as much vitamin C as I need for all the different things that it's going to do in my body. And even if I did that, there may be some crazy viral pandemic where extra vitamin C might be important. So even though I normally get enough, I'm going to mega dose vitamin C. For I this love your dry sense of humor, bro. You got me, man. <laughs> <clears throat> there might be another there might one be coming. A pan- I don't know. So, <laughs> so oxygen is the same thing. If we're, getting, if we're not getting enough, there's consequences. They're called hypoxia, and there's a lot of ways that that occurs in our body. Right. Optimum range of oxygen is 100% saturation. It's what you and I are basically getting right now. Yep. But even if we're getting that day in and day out, there's times where we periodically need to megadose oxygen yeah. so that we can get more, so we can create a surplus or a reservoir to, to heal something, to improve the function of something, to boost our energy, to right. heal some damage, whatever the case, fight an infection. So right. you know, it really comes down to that. So in the, in the more optimization and, and performance standpoint, uh, you could expect absolutely that there's a, a direct um, effect on mitochondria. It increases right. mitochondrial efficiency, right. make more energy, but it also increases mitochondrial density. So your, your mitochondria will literally replicate. Right once it's exposed to enough oxygen over time to say, oh, we can't waste all this extra oxygen. We need more mitochondria to actually process all this extra oxygen. So you get increase in size and density of mitochondria. You get increases in uh, immune system function. You get um, decrease of inflammation. You get a shift of your microbiome in a, in a, in a healthy direction. You get stem cell release and mobilization. Um, you get increased neuro, you know, healing of like old injuries that may have right. happened that were, you know, so, I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on, you know, it's a, it's a pretty long list of uh, general benefits and effects of uh, taking a period of time in your life and going and getting enough of this right. sort of surplus oxygen to really create a healing effect um, to get that optimization. So let me ask you this. So for, so, so compare, um, so a person who's injured, okay, mm-hmm. let's say they have a soft tissue injury you know, some sort of traumatic experience, let's say they're in the gym and they're deadlifting and they injure their lower back or they injure, you know, L4, L5, something um, versus just a person like you and I, you know, who wants to just be optimized, you know, similar to like how we use red light therapy now, like what are the differences in therapy? Like how many times a week and amount of time that you would recommend for someone wanting to heal an injury to just someone for maintenance? Good questions. Yeah. So, some of that answer would really depend also on equipment. In other words, like how much pressure do you have um, access to? How much oxygen do you have access to? But in general terms, you know, let's just say both of those people might do easily 20 or 30 hours, but the injured person would do 20 hours within, you know, a couple of weeks. Right. Whereas the optimizer will do 20 hours over the course of, you know, three months. Right. That kind of thing. So, right. um, when we're dealing with acute issues, we really, it's, it's a cumulative effect. Right, so you want right. to bring the oxygen level up and you want to kind of keep it elevated for a period of time to really get something to heal versus, you know, the optimization piece where you really, it, it's okay if the oxygen levels kind of cycle higher and lower over time, you'll still get a, a very similar optimization um, result. So as far as like the devices and stuff, you know, I want you to talk a little bit about them because obviously you guys have different sizes of chambers you know, you've got Rolls Royce Platinum Deluxe Editions, and then you've got like entry level and stuff like that. But as far as the the um, the characterizations, or you know, the, obviously the various amenities that a lower end model to a higher end model, can you t- just talk a little bit about those? I mean, is there really any difference other than just maybe the? I mean, I guess I don't even know enough to ask about from the top to the bottom. But what are the differences in in the cost? So, you know, some of it has to do with uh, the materials that they're made out of. Got it. 
Um, and some of it has to do with the filtration, the air filtration systems that would be on them. Uh, so, you know, part of it is that I, there are definitely chambers that you could just like, you know, grab on probably on Amazon. <laughs> 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 well, no, Jason, China's done now. So they're gone. <laughs> You know, so they like, can't ship them anymore. Right, though. they can't. <laughs> you know, so you don't want to put like a, this is a medical, to some, you know, to some extent, this is a medical device that you might put in your house. It's under pressure. Like yeah. you, you need some degree of quality control. Of course. Uh, before you put something like this in your home and treat yourself or your family. That's really important. And so, you know, to some extent with these, with these chambers, especially the home units, to, you know, you do get what you pay for. Um, Always. So, it's really critical that the the materials be strong enough, obviously, to withstand the pressure over a long period of time, that they don't stretch and lose their ability to pressurize over time. Uh, they don't blow windows or seams. Like All those are really important. But also, they have different levels of, like I was saying, filtration. Sure. You're basically, you're taking air out of a room and you're compressing it into, so you're taking, you know, three times the amount of air in this room and you're putting it into this chamber, you're breathing that in. You don't only increase the absorption of the oxygen, you're, you're going to increase your exposure to and absorption of a lot of things that are in the air. And so you really want to make sure that the air that's being put into that chamber is as clean and purified as possible. So those filtration systems are also really important. And so some of the better, you know, higher end chambers are going to have better filtration systems. And then there's the difference between, you know, soft chambers and hard chambers. So right. You know, soft chambers are a little bit more fixed in terms of like what pressures you can get to and what oxygen levels you can use. Hard chambers have a much broader range of pressures and oxygen levels. Um, hard chambers are much more complicated to stick in your living room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I was just, I'm just going to ask know. that. So for like, do, you know, I mean, we, we have a lot of clients who put hard chambers in their home and we help them do that. And we have, you know, but, but primarily they're also obviously more expensive. So you know, primarily people have access, more access to, uh, I think, soft chambers for, for home use. So do, when you guys, so I have a bunch of questions. So when you guys put these in um, like chiropractic offices or holistic practitioner offices and stuff like that, do a lot of those people then sell monthly memberships, you know, similar to like what they do with red light and red sauna therapy and all that stuff where people can come in and use them for various times. Is that kind of how the model works? Uh, we see both ways. So um, either always in some degree, some package type, because very few people are just going to do one off. Right. Sure. So, um, yeah, of course, like in, in our clinic, we have an area where we treat people, you know, who have active conditions and then right. we have an, another area that's way more about optimization and we use right. hyperbaric in both of those places. Of course. We just use different hyperbaric in both right. of those places. So the, the optimization side of it tends to have more of a membership model. Right. And the condition side of it tends to have more of like a package model. Uh, where people are doing, you know, 20 to 40 hour packages. kind of. So on the optimization model for a guy who's perfectly healthy, you know, just wants to just get, like you said, you know, oxygenate, super saturate, you know, upregulate mitochondria. Would, would you have them do one session a week for like 30 minutes? You know, is that, nor would that be normal? Again, uninjured, not trying to heal acute injuries or trauma. Would that be normal or is that, I mean, wh where am I with that? So you're pretty close. I think that, um, I think that the effect of all these optimi optimization tools are there's a there's a result we get in that moment, right? And then there's the cumulative effect that we Absolutely. get. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, the thing about oxygen, though, is I find that in order to really get to the point where you could be in a in a total maintenance model, mm -hmm. um, spending a little bit of time up front and front loading it mm -hmm. really changes the physiology. In other words, if you got 30 minutes of oxygen once a week for six months, you're probably never going to really get mitochondrial density changes. Right, right. You know, you're not going to get stem cell, you know, release that kind right, of thing. Right. So you really need to front load it, do, do some, uh, like spend some time for the first, at least four to six weeks, if not eight weeks, where you're doing more than that. Like, you know, a few, at least a few hours a week. So you would know, you do like just daily 30 minutes, four or five days in a row? Is that kind of how you would do it? Yeah. Even more like 60 minutes, I'd say. Wow um that much and then um so what do you recommend people, when people are laying in there for 60 minutes just read a book you know meditate? Yeah, i mean a lot of people depending on what they do right so but some people do some like meditation some yeah, people of music read a book take a nap i mean half the time you know i don't even know how many hours i've done over these years that's but, awesome man uh, majority of the time you know i'm i'm usually taking a nap that's at weird. least for part of it yeah that's that's me too bro like my wife is like as soon as your head hits a pillow yeah 
I can't. Yeah, no, I would, that, that's what I would do. And, and, and when I did it with you guys, you know, just to appear on, and I've done it many, many times before, um, I think I was asleep in three minutes. Yeah. That's pretty, like a little like white noise and a pillow. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much out. All right, a nuclear bomb could go off. It's okay. I'm still sleeping. Um, dude, I mean, it's epic. Um, so like right, right now, like from a standpoint of like franchise opportunities or purchase, and obviously I wrote a blog today, which is on my site, which uh, I'll link to in this when this podcast runs. Um, but, you know, talk a little bit about um, how people can get these obviously in their home or, or what they can do to you know, join a you know, place that has a membership model. Yeah. So um, for home use, you, you know, if people wanted to, you guys could probably add my email somewhere in there or sure, uh, for sure. it would be support, support at HBOT USA. So support at HBOT USA, okay. shoot us an email, you know, we can start a conversation about like what that, what that would look like. So people could either put them in their home, um, which is basically just purchasing, getting into your house and getting some, they're very, the home units are like, they're literally meant for, you know, a mom and a kid to have yeah, to exactly. do it on their own. They're very simple to operate, but we still, we would obviously give some training and, and some, uh, some help with that. Um, on the clinical side, it's a little bit, you know, we have different options. So some people really want to, you know, get some of this equipment, put it in their practice, start treating patients, but you know, they have an idea of how to do it or they just want to do it on their own. That's fine too. So we could just help people get equipment, but we also have different levels of support. So, you know, when we bought that chamber 12 years ago, the first one, we started putting it in the practice. I, you know, I had no idea how, right. like the questions you're asking me, like how many times should somebody go? How much right, 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 frequency? Right. What's the, you know, so we have, you know, business models in place to help people really, you know, here's your paperwork, your consent forms, your patient education, your marketing, your, you know, so we have different levels of assistance and support to help practices implement something like a new technology and build, you know, a bit of a business around it too, so that they could also be successful treating the patients that they treat. You know, the, the results are obviously dependent on the, the proper application of the tool. So right. we have a tool, but if you don't know how to use it properly, uh, you can start getting, you know, subpar results and then find some disappointment with that. So we really want to help doctors get right to it and optimize the equipment that they get so that they're getting the results that they expected to get, you know, right out of the gate. Beautiful. So a couple other things I want to mention. So first off, he has an amazing book that's on Amazon that you can buy right now called Oxygen Under Pressure. And as he knows, he gave me a copy at the event. And as I think I told you this, the next day we flew home and then we were on the plane to Cabo and I was reading it. I read, I, I'm, I'm on page literally like, I think 96, somewhere right, right under a hundred. And, you know, I read it on the entire plane ride down, got off the plane and the world ended. Yes. And we went into high alert, you know, as my, my therapist says, well, Jay, you're on high alert. You're in high alert. So anyway, I haven't finished the book, but um, you know, obviously we'll link to it, but it is an awesome book. Anyone who watches this podcast who wants to learn more about HBOT, um, Jason's kind of like me. He, he takes very um, esoteric technical jargon and he makes it very relatable to people. So it's actually very, very easy to understand and stuff. So you did a great job on that book, but just a couple other questions I have for you and I'll let you go and you can tell people how they can reach out to you. But uh, so pro athletes, my assumption is that, the, the pro football teams, I mean, are they, they got to be adopting this, right? Like, I mean, most of these places have these now, right? So you believe it or not, like not as much as you would. Yes. And not as much as you would. That's think. incredible, I mean, dude. Like to me, I mean, and, and uh, Joe Namath, I mean, he speaks about it a ton, right? right. Uh, you know, for him, for, you know, from a concussion and a yeah. TBI standpoint, yeah. yeah, there's nothing nothing even comes close to this in terms of like, is, is Dr. You know, Gordon, uh, I know you Mark, know Mark, but I mean, is he like heavily pushing these things now too with all the guys he does with TBI and stuff? Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, again, yes. And not as much as you would it think. Should you be. Know? Yeah. Um, I was at, uh, where was I? I forget. I was in a conference last year in Texas and uh, I meet uh, like the head trainer of one of the, you know, pro teams. And he's like, Oh, we have one of those. We never use it. I was like, why the why, fuck do you not use I was it? like, who's yeah. we, who's we, and why don't you use it? He's like, oh, I'm the head coach of this team or a head trainer of this team. I was like, well, I'd like to come in and maybe <laughs> right. have a conversation with you, you know, and, and I did, we went down there and I was like, listen, this is what it does. This is how you use it. Right. This is why they need it, you know, and, and sure enough, now they're using it, but like, you know, it, it should be calm. It, it needs to be calm, especially for football. I yeah. know, dude. That's what I was just thinking. The like hits standard... these guys take. Yes, dude. Yeah. Yes. I thought they were all, I mean, I figured every single NFL team like had five of these things in their training facility. I would say, uh, I don't really know, but 
if they have one in their training facility, it's usually the individual athletes finding That's out crazy. about it and then choosing to have it at home more than it is that the team, you know, and I hope that that changes because that should just be like, literally they should, they should have like a room lined with chamber and they should well, just. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Tom Brady is very vocal about using this, right? Isn't he one of them that is very yeah. vocal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a couple guys too that There's have a couple talked guys, about it. Yeah. There's yeah. A, a few football players, a few uh, basketball players that use them a lot. They talk about it. Uh, in Europe, there's a lot of soccer players who use them a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but yeah, you know, the people who get it, right? But the teams, I think it's also political, right? You have to admit that there's a problem. Right. Uh, yeah. Before you're going to line the locker, you know, the, the training facilities with hyperbaric chambers. Right. So there's a piece Well, I mean, that. you know, the only, I mean, I, I can't imagine personally anything more effective. Now I've used, you know, the cold treatment you know, the free, the, the, what's it called? The cryo. I've used cryo right. stuff too. When I hurt my back about five years ago, I used cryo. Um, this is before you guys, or before I even knew anything about HBOT, but I used cryo for a solid five weeks and that thing massively accelerated. But I mean, if I had access to this, I mean, I would have been using both at the same time. I mean, you, so, so that's the final question. You would use red light cryo and this, if you had a severely acute injury, correct? Yeah, I mean, totally. And depending on what the issue was, maybe a little more of this, a little less of this. But of course, to me, right, the, the proper cold, uh, the red light, 100 yeah. uh, percent oxygen. I mean, that combination, yeah. uh, along with obviously nutritional. Of course, shit, yeah, you got to have lifestyle, you yeah. know, getting inflammation, all that kind of stuff. But from a modality standpoint, um, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so if people want to reach out to you, watch this, connect with you, um, obviously they're going to have links. All your links will be in here and stuff like that. Okay. What's the easiest way people can connect with you? Yeah, I think uh, just support at hbotusa.com. That's like a direct line and uh, you know we're, we're answering questions all day long. Awesome. So uh, Jason, man, it's been an honor to have you on the podcast today. I think you've been amazing. Again, guys, buy his book. It's Oxygen Under Pressure on Amazon. Um, and you know, as everybody who comes on my podcast, you know, I ask my audience, please support the work you guys make a really, a, a, a special deal for people that are, um, fans or audience of Jay Campbell. It'll be on in the blog. It'll be linked in this uh, podcast, but dude, appreciate you coming on. Jay, by the way, uh, you know, we started with the conversation about like how hyperbaric and, um, you know, COVID yep. come together a little bit. So yep. I've put out already two videos very specifically on that topic and another one, I think tomorrow. So um, our, our YouTube channel, HBOT USA, uh, it's got a ton of videos, but very specifically recently, we've put out a lot on immunity, general immune system, microbiome, and a few very specific to this question with, uh, in regards to oxygenation around this virus. Beautiful, man. So that's uh, on YouTube. So it's youtube.com forward slash HBOT. HBOT USA. HBOT USA. Awesome. Okay. So guys, make sure you guys go to his YouTube channel. So again, man, I appreciate you coming on today. So right. guys, remember, support the amazing people that come on our channel. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.